Okay, this is the first of uh, two video lectures that um, I am uh, making for you guys while I am away. Uh, this one is, is on Chapter 8, Passive Solar Energy. Um, I'm going to go through the contents uh, of the chapter. Uh, this video is just going to cover um, the slides from, uh, from the PowerPoint presentation that I made for the chapter um, and the example problems. I'll walk through the example problems with you guys. Uh, but I'm de definitely depending on you guys to read the chapters to supplement what I'm doing uh, with these video lectures. Okay, so let's look at some fundamental concepts. First off, passive solar energy is generally defined to include uh, systems in which the flow of solar energy is by passive processes, uh, such as uh, natural convection. So the distinction between an active and a passive system is that a passive system uses no mechanical intervention to distribute energy but it relies on radiation and free convection. So a passive solar system generally possesses five different components. A, a collector, some collector arrangement, uh, absorber, thermal mass, a distribution protocol, and some sort of uh, control strategy. Um, passive collectors uh, include windows or more exotic features such as a water roof. Uh, an absorber, for example, is a, high, is a hard surface with a high absorptivity that is in direct path of the solar uh, irradiation entering through a collector. The passive solar thermal storage mass can be provided by external walls or floors or waterfalls. So it's almost like having something of high thermal mass in front of a window that can collect heat uh, during the day and dissipate that heat at night. Um, these thermal masses usually receive energy for solar irradiation in the winter but are um, blocked. Uh, in the summer, so they help keep a room cool or a space cool in the summer and help heat it in the winter. Um, if a structure, for example, has south-phasing glazing, uh, glazing is another word for window, but no thermal mass storage, uh, the structure is called sun-tempered. So as you know, the sun passes over top um, during the summer and more towards the south, and paints a path more towards the south in the winter time. So if you have a window that faces south, you're collecting the sun during the summer, during the winter time, but during the summer, uh, the sun will be more over top. So the use of a south-facing glazing, uh, up to seven percent of the floor area, can reduce the heating requirement, uh, especially in a cold climate. So if the south-facing glazing exceeds seven percent of the floor area, the thermal mass storage is needed to utilize the solar radiation incident on the structure. So as you can tell, if you have a large bay window and you want to capitalize more on the sunlight to heat the room, it would be good to have a floor that has some sort of uh, high thermal mass in order to capture that energy over a long period. All right, so let's go over different types of systems. Um, this is in uh, figure 8.1 in your book. It's a schematic of a direct gain system, and figure 8.1b uh, uh, illustrates a direct gain implementation in a, in a house. So the thermal mass uh, thickness should not exceed six inches. So here you have a floor that has a certain thermal mass with a window of incoming solar radiation. Solar radiation heats the floor, and free convection allows it to heat the room. Um, two well accepted rules of thumb are that 150 pound mass of masonry is needed for every square foot of south phasing glazing, or that nine square feet of thermal mass storage area is needed for every square foot of south facing glazing. So there's some rules of thumbs in terms of how much wind, how much um, floor you should have for how much window. Uh, figure 8.2 uh, in your book presents a schematic of an example of an indirect gain passive solar system uh, with a trum wall. So you have here a window and some sort of high thermal mass wall in front of the window that absorbs the heat during the day and dissipates it inside the house during the night. The trouble wall is usually a thick constructed of, uh, wall constructed of masonry and designed to absorb solar radiation during the day and store it and radiate it at night to heat. Uh, figure 8.3 looks at an example of an isolated gain solar system, so a sun space. Uh, again, you have here a space that's completely encapsulated by a window. And then again, you have a big wall in front of it and, uh, that uh, marks one of the walls of the sun space. It absorbs heat and dissipates it into the house. Mm. 
something else, another important feature uh, implemented in passive solar uh, is daylighting. Uh, the use of energy from the sun for interior illumination uh, erases the need, at least during daytime hours, for artificial lights. So that can obviously um, reduce energy needs as well. Uh, this particular photograph is of the um, National um, Energy Research Facility. Uh, it is a uh, state-of-art research facility that was built in the um, early 90s. And actually, it's interesting that this facility faces 15 degrees east of due south and is built onto a slight slope to take advantage of Earth shelter. So it might not be necessarily visible too much in the picture, but where I just circled would be a hill. And this thing is placed, uh, this building is placed in such a way as to use the hill for shading. Um, and it has a lot of energy features in there, such as window shades, evaporative cooling, and recovery systems. And it's built as an example of. Uh, how passive energy can be used to minimize HVAC needs. So how do you quantify passive solar features? Um, there are what we will call first and second order procedures for estimating or quantifying the effects of various different solar uh, features and are based on correlating a bunch of results and uh, from computer simulations. So the most common single variable method used to express climate uh, climat climatological effects on buildings energy usage is called degree day. So the degree day is built around the concept of a no load balance point temperature and an average daily temperature. Uh, it is assumed that the no load temperature is 65 degrees. The difference between the no load temperature and the average temperature is defined as the number of de degree days for that day. So the total heating degree days HDD for given location is the sum of all of the daily heating degree days and the cooling degree days, CDD, is the sum of the daily cooling degree days for the location. The total values are a useful metric for estimating energy usage to heat and cool a building since the energy required is essentially proportional to the heating degree days and the cooling degree days. So cooling degree days and heating degree days data are available from the National Weather Service and are archived by the National Climatic Data Center. So for the purposes of, the uh, of um, this course, this text actually has a figure, that uh, figure 8-6, which presents a contour of degree Fahrenheit heating degree days for the continental US. So it's kind of hard to see um, in this presentation, but if you were to go ahead and open up your book to figure 8-6, you can see that. Um, you have uh, different values of heating degree days over the course of the uh, throughout the United States here. So if you have Florida down here, um, the counter level here is 500, and it gets up the values close to 10,000 up in the north. So the higher the heating degree day, the more severe the weather. So in this figure, the heating degree day values in the north are much larger than the south, and the heating degree days in the mountains of the west show the effects of elevation and latitude. Um, just a quick uh, look at the nomenclature we're going to be using as we try to quantify the effects of passive solar integration. Uh, you can see, uh, first off, you have A sub P, which is the vertically projected net south facing solar blazing. So basically, it's the area of the window facing south. Uh, there's another one here, NLC, which is called the net building load coefficient. It's the net heating load of the non-solar portion of the structure per heating degree day. I know it sounds a little confusing, but basically think of the load of a building that is not being uh, a comp uh, compensated for by passive heating or passive, yeah, by passive heating per heating degree day. So it would be usually at a of energy kilojoules um, per degree or per heating degree day. That would be the part of the building, the portion of the heating load uh, for a building that is being done by non-passive means. Uh, Qnet is a net heating load, uh, which is basically the net building load coefficient multiplied by the heating degree days. Uh, Q solar is a heating load provided by solar energy. Q auxiliary is a heating load not provided by solar energy. 
And here are some other factors, um, some of which are going to be tabulated in your books that we're going to go over some tables and how to look up. You have the load collector ratio, uh, LCR. The load collector ratio is um, basically the net building load coefficient over the uh, projected net south facing wall solar glazing. And SSF, solar saving fraction, is the fraction of the total heating energy for a building provided by solar. So it's Q solar over Q net. So uh, just by looking at some simple uh, math here, you see that the net heating energy required is the sum of the solar contribution plus the auxiliary needed. So um, the idea is to try to maximize the solar to minimize the auxiliary needed. So divided by QNet and solving for Q solar over QNet, uh, you can actually get your, uh, so your ratio of solar heat over net heat as a function of um, or basically uh, being able to compute the solar saving fraction. So the auxiliary heat, you can actually quantify the amount of auxiliary heat you need uh, or the auxiliary load as a function of the solar saving fraction, where the solar saving fraction is actually a factor that you can look up. So let's go ahead and look at how to use these uh, variables in order to quantify the effects of passive solar features. So there's going to be two. There's one uh, first level method and the second level method. So let's do the first one. The first level method is uh, based on the observation that resonances that effectively incorporate passive solar features have similar, excuse me, have similar net building load coefficients uh, values per floor area and climate. So it's dependent on the solar savings fraction. So the net building load, uh, net building load coefficient, square feet of floor area in conventional buildings with energy saving features is typically between uh, 120 and 160 kilojoules per cooling, uh, per degree Celsius heating degree day, or 68 BTU. Uh, these values are reduced by 20% when passive solar features are added, resulting in um, the Net load, uh, net load, net building load coefficient per floor area value is 100 to 130. So, um, for a well-designed passive solar features, the expected um, load collector ratio values are climate dependent. Again, the load collector value is the um, net load, load the net building load coefficient per per area of uh, projected net south facing solar glazing. So. Um, the best thing to do is just let's skip to an example problem and uh, we'll go ahead and see how we can apply this. So this is from your book. So you have a 2,500 square foot house located in Meridian, Mississippi. The estimated net building load coefficient per square foot of floor area is 7.5 BTU per degree Fahrenheit heating degree day foot squared. Estimate the characteristics of an optimum passive solar design and the auxiliary heating energy required. So if we go ahead and um, and do this, they give us that our NLC coefficient is 7.5 BTU per Fahrenheit heating degree day per square. Um, I apologize for um, the noise that I imagine the pen is making when I write. I, I tried to to avoid that, but I can't seem to do that, so uh, we'll just have to try to suffer through this. Okay, so um, it's asking for uh, how much auxiliary heating we need. So if we go ahead and we take that value and we multiply it by the total square foot, because they give us um, basically the net load coefficient per floor area, we get that we have 18,000. Uh, 750 BTU per heating degree day. Um, according to the uh, prior slide, if we're looking at a warm climate, right? So uh, again, if you go back two slides here, they give us that the um, load collector ratio have two values: one for a warm climate, one for a cold climate. Um, in this case, 
we have the load collector ratio is going to be for uh, a warm climate, which is what I would assume Mississippi is being. So if we have that, we get 30 BTU per Fahrenheit in the three days per square, which basically equals the net load coefficient per area of, um, of window facing south. So if we do our math, we solve for the um, area of the window facing south by looking at the net load coefficient over the load collector ratio. It gives us an area of 625 square feet. Okay, so um, that gives us the area of the window. Now, what it's asking is for the, the auxiliary heat. So if you look at the auxiliary heat needed, it's 1 minus the solar savings fraction multiplied by the net load coefficient multiplied by the number of heating degree days. The number of heating degree days, or the, the um, expected uh, solar savings fraction, can be found by looking at figure 8-7. This is a figure from your book. Um, and what it does is it looks at the percentage of solar savings fractions for different regions of the United States. So we can approximate from this that um, the solar savings fraction for Meridian and Mississippi is going to be about 0.6. That is uh, figure 8.7. And according to figure uh, 7.12, you can look at, um, from the prior chapter, you can look at the number of heating degree days there, which is about 1358 Celsius or uh, 2400 So if we're going to go ahead and calculate and plug in all these values, you can get that we need an auxiliary heating of 18.3 times 10 to the 6 GPU. Okay, so this is a little confusing at first, but uh, the key factors is looking at the area you're located in, which looks at the solar savings fraction, um, the severity of the weather looking at um, heating degree days, and looking at um, uh, an effective um, uh, passive um, properties that gives you uh, a net loading coefficient of 7.5 BTU per heating degree day per, per, uh, per, per square foot of uh, house area. All right, um, I hope that's clear. If it's not, send me some emails, and uh, I will definitely be available by email. Uh, you just might need to give me a day to respond. Um, this first level method, uh, the results of that example problem gives some indication of the effectiveness of an optimum use of solar features, but the solution doesn't include any details. Um, so this second level method, which I think is a little more effective that we're going to go over, gives details of solar features um, for specific types of uh, solar, uh, passive solar units that we would use. So here we go. The, this is called the LCR method. So instead of um, rules of thumb, the LCR method is based on uh, computer-based analyses of various passive solar features in a variety of cities. So the, the LCR method is philosophically similar to the F-chart approach uh, for active solar features that you guys did in Chapter 7. The LCR method is specific to a given structure in that the net load coefficient and the projected solar area are required. So from these two quantities, the the, um, the load collector ratio, LCR, can be determined by, def by the same definition earlier, where the load coefficient ratio is equal to the um, net building load coefficient over the projected area of the south face of blazing. So once the um, uh, load coefficient ratio is known, the solar savings fraction can be found for a given city by matching the low coefficient ratio with specific passive solar features. Uh, there are five different passive solar configurations covered by the LCR method, um, and these are all charts in your book. So one is going to be the uh, direct gain. Another one is a vented trum wall, uh, unvented trum wall, water wall, and sun space. Uh, Appendix 8A in your book, with, um, there's two things here I'm mentioning uh, within each configuration. Different values of various feature parameters are used, so the parameter variations for each of the five types lead to uh, 94 distinctive passive solar energy systems. So for a given city, the solar savings fraction is tabulated as a function of the load coefficient ratio. 
I, I know this sounds confusing, the best thing to do is to go over the example problem. So let's try the last example problem of the chapter. We have a 2,000 square foot home with passive solar features is located in Nashville, Tennessee. The heating load analysis determines that the net load coefficient is 12,000 BTU per uh, degree Fahrenheit heating degree day. The home has 150 square feet of direct gain solar glazing. Characteristics of the direct gain features include double glazing, which means double pane window, uh, nighttime insulation, and 30 BTU per square foot degree Fahrenheit of thermal storage. Determine the solar savings fraction and the auxiliary heating required. Okay, so first off, you need to find out the load coefficient ratio. Right. That's defined as the net, net building load coefficient over the projected area of the south facing glazing. So the problem is to us we have the NLC is 12,000, um, the area of the window is 150 square feet. That gives us a low coefficient ratio of 80 BTU per, per Fahrenheit heating degree day foot square. Alright, so if you go back to the appendices in your book for the passive solar systems, you should set, you should see by the um, uh, classification given, this the characteristics of the direct gain features, you should be able to find the classification. Um, one disadvantage about uh, this particular lecture is that I did not upload any of the tables uh, into the, I didn't integrate them into the uh, uh, into the notes, so, but you guys have used many tables in the past, so I'm confident that you can figure out how to use it. If you turn back to the appendices and you look at uh, direct gain, so, uh, passive solar systems, and you look at the features, double glazing, uh, nighttime insulation, and 30 BTU per foot squared Fahrenheit of thermal storage, you should see that the classification is direct gain, gain period. Okay? And then, with that, in the tables you'll find that for Nashville, for a direct gain A3 classification and a low coefficient ratio of 80, you should see that the solar savings fraction is 20% and your heating degree day is 2696 Fahrenheit. So the auxiliary power needed is one minus solar savings fraction multiplied by the net building, net, net building load coefficient multiplied by the heating degree date. You get that you need 35 times 10 to the 6 BTU of auxiliary heating needed. Okay. Um, I hope that's I hope that's clear. Now um, also, let's take a second, and for the same problem, how much mass, how much thermal mass do I need uh, for, for this particular problem? So if I go ahead and try to find that out, I can see that for our classification, our direct gain classification past the solar system, I see another factor that's given that the mass area per glazing is thick. So if I look at a thickness of two inches, I see that I need five hundred pounds worth of um, worth of thermal mass. And that can also be a recount computed by just looking at the volume times the density, right? So if I look um, I'm at 6 times 150 square feet times 2 inches uh, times 1 foot per 12 inches multiplied by a density of 150 pound mass per, um, per cubic foot so we get the same answer. Alright, um, guys, I hope that was clear. Uh, this is the, like I said, it's not the most optimal way to teach this stuff um, via video, but 
I, I hope that the example problems help. Uh, definitely read the chapter. That should hopefully supplement anything that I wouldn't be able to add in class. Um, if you have any questions, definitely email me. The only thing that I regret not being able to show you are the actual uh, um, uh, charts and to be able to go through this step by step with you guys. But uh, again, I'm confident that if you've used enough charts in your time here to be able to figure out how to go through it. Um, again, any questions you have, please don't hes hesitate to email me and I'll do my best to respond quickly. Alright, uh, that's it for now. And uh, there's one more, one more uh, uh, video for uh, photovoltaics, chapter, chapter 9. Thanks.